Hi, it's Tuesday, Tuesday, June the 4th, 2024, and this is Exploring Sunday Scriptures. The scriptures for this upcoming Sunday, which happens to also be the second Sunday in June. Seems like this is going to fly by, but June is one of those months that has five Sundays. As I shared last week, this is loosely, and I mean really loosely, based out of some of the reflections I had having read this book. I don't actually particularly endorse this book or would say that it's um, very scholarly or... Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it per se, but there were some ideas in it that were seeds that germinated that provided me then with this little four-week sermon series based on some of the, the little ideas in here that I guess I took and ran with myself. Now, following this series through the course of the summer is going to be, once again, based off of scriptures or themes, topics uh, that are submitted by you. Those can be things that for you are meaningful it could be things for you that you simply would like to hear more about or a scripture that's always confused you that you would like to have explored and explained a little more and that worship has never really offered that. And so here is an opportunity to do exactly that. Please submit those to me via email or uh, you can um, write them on one of the connection cards for in the pews on Sunday morning hand it to me in a note, um, or just let me know. Just talk to me, as I would love to put those together into the series that'll carry us through the summer. So this week, continuing with this current series, as I said, loosely based on this, I wanted to highlight having explored identity last week, revealing our true selves, and understanding that part of the the purpose for which we are wonderfully and fearfully made is one of holiness and joy— to use a scripture to explore how it is that we share that joy. And it's a very familiar scripture, and I also uplifted this one because being June, this used to be the wedding month. That's actually shifted now to the fall, to October. But whenever I hit June as my own anniversary, my own wedding was in June, at the end of June, I think of wedding season. And this is the most common scripture associated with weddings, 1 Corinthians 13. Some... Uh, couples choose to have the entire chapter. Some couples choose only pieces of, of this chapter of Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. I'm going to use the entire thing, and so I'm going to read the entire thing. I'm going to explore with you some of the realities that are behind this, as we often only hear it away from the rest of the letter to the church in Corinth. Um, and as always, trying to sit it within that context, I encourage you to think about those things happening in your life and happening in the world right now. So what are those things that are influencing how you experience worship, um, how you are coming to worship, what you are bringing to worship? Are there things that are worrying you? Are there things that are filling you with joy right now? Are there things... Um, you know, just the station or stage of life that you are in. So this could be transitional moments. If you happen to be looking at uh, a, perhaps a move coming up or a change of employment or a variety of other things. All of those things influence how it is that we encounter God's inspired word in scripture and ultimately what we bring to worship with us. And so also uh, how we hear prayer and, and the hymns we sing and a variety of other things. So let's get into the scripture. This is 1 Corinthians 13. This is the New Revised Standard Version. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. 
When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. So this passage is, uh, again, the most common passage used in weddings, and, and it tends to be so because of what it expresses about love. But as we sit it more within its context here in the letter, I think it actually even gains more power. It became, gains a lot more meaning than when we remove it and hear it only in the context of weddings. Now, Paul has been discussing spiritual gifts prior to this, uh, such as tongues and prophecy. And now he basically is revealing that which supersedes or is above all of that. And uh, he denotes this, we hear this as love. And this is the love for others, which is known within the church and inspired ultimately by the love of God in Christ for us through the Holy Spirit. So that's really what Paul is getting at. Now, one of the things to, to remind ourselves whenever we come across a passage coming out of the, the um, correspondence with the church in Corinth is the church in Corinth couldn't do anything right. This was a church that seemed to constantly get it wrong, whether they were overzealous in their application of their faith or just not very thoughtful. And so Paul's letters were corrective in nature. So often trying to get them back to the right kind of interactions and behavior to, to make them um, represent Christ appropriately. Uh, and so there were lots of issues that you can find evidence for in, in the Corinthian church. Uh, one of those, for example, was that they would come to the Lord's Supper and some people would get there early and eat it all up and there wouldn't be any left over for those that came later. And it was this sense that somehow that food came, had some spiritual gifts, some something in it that if you had more, you were better off. And Paul then tries to correct and say, the most important thing is that all of us have a place at the table and that there is enough for us all. And so eating more of it isn't going to connect you deeper with God. That's just an example. So when we have Paul speaking here after spiritual gifts, and this again has to do with the sense that, that there have been those that's, that, that have said that a certain type of spiritual gift is evidence of a closer relationship with God or or uh, being more advanced spiritually. So Paul, after speaking about spiritual gifts, comes to this chapter to talk about that which should, that is above all, and love being that. And this is agape love. This is self-sacrificing, self-giving love. So this is selfless love. So this is not about the love that you, um, self-centered love. This is not about you. This is really about what you share with the world, what you share with others. And it begins with this line, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So in other words, I'm just a noisemaker. I'm just out there making noise. If what I speak doesn't come with a heart of compassion alongside of it, if I am not being thoughtful about the feelings of others, if I'm not trying to make sure that whatever I say is loving in nature, and that includes not saying anything at all. So just talking and talking and talking and talking and talking, or not speaking up when you should, you know, these are things that make you a noisy gong, just a just a noisemaker, just filling all of the 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 moments uh, with noise. And then we go on to prophetic powers, understand all mysteries, all knowledge. If I have faith so that I can even change the landscape, remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. So this is again looking at even as advanced as we can be, scientifically or otherwise, if it is not coming out of a heart of compassion, if it's not coming from a place of how this is that this expresses love to others, love for others, then it's meaningless um, and it amounts to nothing. 
It amounts to nothing. Now think about that and how much credit we give for the, you know, our educational attainment, which is, I, I'm a firm believer in education, but the chips on the wall is what they call them. But all of the degrees and awards and all of that, well, here Paul is saying, it doesn't matter how much of that stuff you have. If there is no love, if that is not influencing how it is that you share love with the world, it, it amounts to nothing. It amounts to nothing. I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, hand over my body so I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. So this is looking at even spiritual practices of uh, like aestheticism, which is um, living simply or living with nothing, living only on the generosity of others. And so it, it's again trying to sort of posit this sense of this should not equate with proximity or, or, or a sense of connectedness to God. Love has to be at the root that may lead to such patterns in one life, in one's life, but it begins with love and it begins out of a place of love for others. So a denial of self, let's say, um, as it says, uh, give away all my possessions. If that's beginning from this place of I um, don't want to be absorbed into a material life anymore and to find myself focused only on that. And so I'm going to give away everything for the benefit of others that I may be detached from this. Perhaps we can again align it with love, but love is what should come before uh, any of these other things. It, it, it forms the impetus. It forms the, the impulse for what drives these things. And then we have kind of, I think, what most of us would call the most beautiful section of this, which is the description of what this love looks like. And we have all sorts of um, words here to describe this love. I tell couples when I counsel them, this is not something that at a wedding we say is achieved. This is something that is the ambition of a lifetime or a relationship. Now, we could say the same for ourselves. This is, as we see this list out of Paul, this is an ambitional list. Being in relationship with God is growing in our love for one another and for the world. And growing in that love means growing in the ways that reflect God. Well, how would they reflect God? And, and this is where we find then um, that list to be a good starting point. Well, more of a growing point to how it is that we reflect God. Patient, kind, not envious, boastful, or arrogant, or rude, not insistent on your own way, um, not irritable, not resentful, um, doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. That doesn't mean that that doesn't come without challenge, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and never ends. Then we have this transition into the next section that talks about the things that will eventually have an end. Prophecies, they will come to end. Tongues, they will cease. So this is looking at the spiritual gifts that are referred to in the prior chapter, but it also is just sort of saying that at some point we won't... Um, be able to speak anymore, or we won't have the gift of, of being a prophetic voice for God, um, or this moment that is looked toward will be perhaps achieved, and so the prophecy will be fulfilled, perhaps. It might be a way to put it. So we can look at this even as vision. The church has a vision to make connections, to offer opportunities in faith, love, and service, and that vision compels us missionally and how we seek to achieve that. So strategies in order to implement, to, to live into that vision. Now, we'll probably never get to a place to say we successfully did that. But in an earlier time of Christ Church's life, the vision that it had, which was to be a gathering place for all people of our neighborhood and area, drove it toward a vision of a need of more and more space in order to house and to provide that which it sought to do. And at, at 
at one point in the 60s, when the last part of the building was added, it achieved that vision of being as large as it could to provide that which it sought to do for this neighborhood in this area. Um, and so, you know, that prophecy came to an end. That sense of that vision had been achieved. Uh, and it goes on from there. We know only part, we prophesy only a part. When the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. And when I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, or reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways, seeing in a mirror dimly. These are all kind of similar concepts. Then we'll see face to face. Now we know only a part. Then I will fully know, even as I've fully been known. Well, what's this have to do with this whole conversation on love? But it's sort of saying again that this is an incomplete moment, that there is a complete moment that yet awaits us. And as we apply love in our lives, we get closer to that completeness. But there is now in our experience only small foretastes or hints of what that completeness is like. And so it is that we work and apply ourselves uh, towards that. And we conclude then with that last verse, and now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. Um, this is a, a typical triad of Paul, these three virtues or aspects, faith, hope, and, and love. And he certainly is saying that out of the three of these, while faith is great and hope is necessary, love is, is, is that driving factor. This is, this is the very heart of God and therefore must be our heart as well. So having explored identity last week and coming to embrace our, the truth of ourselves that God knows about us, we then have an aspect of what does it look like then to share that with the world? So as we understand ourselves honestly in God's eyes, and as we understand that what God seeks for us in our lives is, um, is joy, is holiness, how is it that we then impart or live that? And so this is seeking to ponder that and to use Paul's word as a springboard into really thinking ourselves creatively about what it looks like, how it is that we live out that we share, even if it's only in part, as sort of Paul alludes to here in 1 Corinthians, um, our holiness and our joy. How is it that we share our holiness and our joy? Well, we do so in love, and Paul has some, some very practical ways, patience, kindness, not envious or boastful. So a small primer on the scripture for this week. I hope you will be joining us remotely or in person as we continue this exploration through these uh, next three weeks of June before we go into our summer series. And I hope you're finding them compelling and hopefully something perhaps that is combating against a sense of hopelessness or cynicism. I know I certainly have been battling those over the state of the world into really uncovering a, um, what God seeks for us and for our world and how this is an antidote perhaps to all of that. So I'll see you next week when we explore the next scripture that is part of the series. God bless you. Talk to you soon.